Amen. Well, it's great to be with everybody. You can uh, open your Bibles to Hezekiah. Guys, get in there. Uh, there is no Hezekiah, in case you haven't figured it out yet. And, uh, you know, this, we got to know our Bibles, amen? And uh, so I want to talk about really how to know the Bible at a deep level, amen? And we've been doing this uh, new Genesis series in the church, and Genesis means beginnings, amen? So what we're doing is we're looking at different things in Genesis, or sometimes in the Gospel of John, which is sometimes called New Genesis, where we're looking just for foundational things that are going to help us as Christians. Amen? And so let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. And we talked about last time we were in this series, the creation of the world. Amen? Talked about the pre-edemic era. We talked about Satan's rebellion. We talked about all the creation and how there's no excuse to not believe in God. Amen? And that we can look at creation and we can recognize structure and order and system and design and that God has revealed himself in nature. Amen? So we're going to look in Genesis chapter 2. And as you're turning there, let's say a word of prayer. Yeah. Father uh, God, we want to come before you right now. We thank you. For all that you've done for us, God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for uh, this offering that we gave. We pray we can shake off anything from daylight savings, God, and maybe has us a little in a funk here, God, or uh, Lord, anything that might distract us. And right now, God, we pray you give us a zeal for your work. I pray as we get in this sermon, Father God, that it's something that, that changes us. We love you with everything, Father, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Foundation to our walk with God is the Bible. And the Word of God is the way that God chose to communicate His message to us. In Genesis chapter 2, after God had created mankind, of course, Eve would be created, and we're going to talk more about Eve at our super regional service. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You know, God at this time created man in this paradise. And if there was a Bible back then, it would just be these few sentences. Don't eat from this tree. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Only thing to read in your quiet times in the morning is to remember, don't eat from that tree. Amen. <laughs> By the time Genesis chapter 3 comes, we learned last time that Satan was already a fallen creature in the garden. And so the serpent we saw led an invasion into heaven and, of course, was punished by being thrown to the earth. And now in this new creative state, after God has set everything into motion, we find the serpent as a fallen creature in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You know, this is what the enemy does. He gets people to question God's word. And so for the first time, the idea of interpretations introduced into the world by Satan. Is that really what God said? Get your thinking, will I really die? What do you mean by die? You see, even today, this is how the enemy works. Is that really what the Bible means? What is baptism really? Is it really with water? Is it really with the Spirit? Is Jesus Christ really God? Or was he just a prophet? Or like, all this stuff, this is what the enemy does. And Satan knows the Bible and he knows how to twist it. And so we need to understand that we live in a world of interpretation. Now, everybody interprets. And we'll talk about the Bible says there's no private interpretation, but we all interpret. And so it's a matter of figuring out what's the right interpretation of the Bible. If a professor, if you guys are all in this class, we're here at UCR, and a professor goes, hey, I'm going to give you an assignment. You need to write a paper. It's got to be two pages, MLA format, 
Times New Roman font, uh, 12 on Microsoft Word, or whatever, you can go out and interpret that however you want. You could come back and go, oh, I only wrote a couple paragraphs because I thought you were using hyperbole or exaggerating when you said to do two pages. I thought you were just trying to, you know, have dramatic effect there. So I only wrote a couple paragraphs. And when you said Times New Roman, I thought you wanted me to write about time, how times were in the Roman Empire. <laughs> Doesn't matter, that guy's getting an F. But that's just how I privately interpreted it. Well, it's the responsibility of the student to seek the professor's interpretation if there's confusion. Are you with me right here? And God's our professor. Jesus Christ is the professor. He's written his Bible. And you can't stand before God and go, well, I just read John 3, 16. And it said all I got to do is believe. And so I thought I was good to go. He's going to go, you didn't seek the professor's interpretation of the scripture. And so we're going to talk a lot about today is how do we interpret the Bible? I was really thinking through before San Bernardino goes, what are some of my deepest convictions that I want to share uh, with, with the group here? And this is one of them, because when I first became a Christian, my idea of how God spoke to me is I'd wake up in the morning. I would go, OK, what's the Holy Spirit want to say to me today? Um, and I do this kind of like raffle through my Bible and then go, boom, okay, let's see here. They got up and returned once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and they assembled together. Okay, maybe that's what God wants me to read today. I even, I confess, even as a young, you know, teen disciple, I'd go outside sometimes in the park and I'd just like sit my Bible open and like the wind would come and start blowing the pages. <laughs> I just kind of wait to see where it lands and go, that's what God wants me to read today, man. <laughs> but, you know, this, this we're going to find today is actually not how God wants us to study the scriptures. There's a story of a, a, a man who had the same idea of how you interpreted the passages, the, the Bible. And so he wakes up, he goes, you know something, I'm going to see what God wants for me today. And he flips through his Bible and he hits his finger and he lands on Matthew 27, 5 that says, then Judas went out and hanged himself. He's like, huh, I wonder what God's trying to show me here. Maybe this was a, let's do a do-over. Maybe this was a mistake. Does it again, and his page lands on Luke chapter 10, verse 37. It says, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, you know. No, maybe try again. Come on, Holy Spirit, you know, and, and, and flips through it and lands on John 13, verse 27. and says, what you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. <laughs> We got to understand, we need to know how to correctly read the Word of God, amen? And that's the title of the lesson today, is simply, New Genesis Part 2 is about correctly handling the Word of Truth. Because in the beginning, that's what Satan attacked. And so we need to understand, how are we going to combat this? How are we going to have the right interpretation of the Bible? And there is a right interpretation. Are you with me right here? The Bible says there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's not meant to be all these different denominations. There is a right way to read the Bible that God believes we can come to a conclusion on. Yeah. Now, there's six C's to understanding how to read the scripture. Six C's. The first C is commitment, amen? <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. We got to turn the zeal up a little bit here, guys. I, I, I mean, <laughs> got to turn the zeal up a little bit here. I know you lost an hour of sleep. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, look at what the Bible tells us. Now, Paul is writing this to Timothy, an evangelist, okay? I'm going to be talking to you guys about things that are just going to help you take your Bible study deeper today. Um, this is why we do, though, have evangelists and women's ministry leaders in the church that are, in theory, trained in this way. So that they can answer tough questions and help teach the church how to correctly handle God's word. But you know, if you're going to go looking for treasure in the ocean, you're not going to like just get some floaties on and stay at the surface of the water. Because there you'll just find empty water bottles floating around. If you're going to get the treasure, you got to go down to the very depths of the sea. Amen. And that's where you find all the treasure. You guys ready to go deep into the sea of God's words? And a lot of people, they, they like dumb churches because dumb churches are easy to lead. I'm being dead serious. There are people out there that, that love just people to be stupid. 
Wow. Just make disciples. I'm a first principles basic Christian, and that's all I do. Yes, sir. I don't understand why I do what I do. I have no depth to the Bible. And that is not what we're about. I believe you got to know why you do what you do. And if you feed the church, the church will feed the world. Are you with me right here? And so some people go, well, I, I've had people go, oh, man, I think I feel like you preached above my head. I, you're, you're using words, bro, that they don't understand. I go, dude, they have a phone. They can open it up, and there's a website called dictionary.com. And you can look it up. But we got to challenge ourselves to not be dumb. To go, well, I want to have some depth. If I don't understand something, I don't move forward from it. Are you with me right here? I, I, I read books all the time. Sometimes it's not even Christian stuff. If I don't know a word, I look it up. I want to find out what does this mean so I can have depth and understand and relate to the world and be effective at my Bible study. And in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved as a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth and the church said I mean I don't know about you guys but man I feel shame when I can't answer someone's Bible question I feel ashamed if I don't know where a scripture is I forgot about it and the Bible's charging the evangelist here don't be ashamed but commit to do your best now if you're doing your best you never need to feel shame even if you don't know because we all got to start somewhere. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we start? How do we get into this? Amen. But it starts with the first C is commitment. Without a commitment to be a great student of the Bible. I'm not talking about just commitment to have your quiet times every day. I'm talking about a commitment to be a great student and to have great study of the Bible. None of the other C's are going to matter that we're going to talk about. Okay. And so I want to ask, are you guys ready to dedicate yourself to know your Bible at a very deep level? Now, we're all going to be in different places. We all come from different academic backgrounds. Some of us finished you know, college. Some of us did not. That's not the point. God says, do your best. And it's going to fall in all kinds of different places. So we got to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and deal with this idea of interpretation. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, we need to distinguish. Interpretation is different than translation. Yes. And I think that's important to understand. So sometimes people go, well, that's just your interpretation when we're trying to study the Bible with someone. And you, I always am kind of like, yeah, you're right. It is my interpretation. And you have your interpretation. So we need to figure out what's the right interpretation. Because everybody interprets. I grew up, we didn't go to church much, but my dad came from a Seventh-day Adventist denomination background. My step family came from a Catholic background and my mom came from a Protestant background. So I came to the Bible with all of those lenses and those traditions when I first saw the Bible. And part of what we do when we study the Bible is we have to remove those lenses, if you will, of tradition and try to see the Bible in its plain sense. And so we're going to talk about some different concepts on how do we arrive to the right conclusion in the Bible. Amen. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read here in verse 20. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1, but there will be false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Wow. You preach God's word in a false method, you'll go to hell. That's how serious God is about this. He goes, there are false teachers out there that are going to lead people astray. And so we need to have good principles on how to study God's word to arrive at the right conclusions that he teaches. And the Bible says that scripture is called prophecy. It came from God, but it was used men to write down God's very words. And this is pretty significant if you really think about it, because it actually gives testimony to the Bible being a supernatural book. Of course, the Bible was written by 40 different authors over a time period of 1,500 to 2,000 years. And it's debated a little bit the time scale. And three different continents it was written on, three different languages, the Old Testament being Hebrew, the New Testament being Greek, and then there being some Aramaic and places like John and the book of Daniel. And what's really interesting about this is that 
the odds of them all telling one unified, yeah. coherent story is incredible. It, it, it's, it's, it's impossible. And this is how we know it's from God. Because it tells over 1,500 years people that didn't even know each other. Some kings, some tax collectors, some guys dwelling in the desert, some poor, some rich. All told the same story about God Almighty. And so the Bible itself is supernatural proof. And I haven't even gotten into all the science it discovered before science discovered it. Things like circumcision and quarantining and, and, and the, 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 the sphere of the earth and all this stuff the Bible said before science even did. You know, up until the Roman times, they thought there were 3,000 stars during the Roman Empire in the sky. Gosh, Genesis, God said you can't count them. They're numerous. I mean, God is on top of it. Are you with me right here? You know, there are 300 different prophecies about Jesus, around 306, that he fulfills every single one. Thousands about Israel that are fulfilled. Thousands about nations in the Middle East, about Egypt, the Edomites. We serve a supernatural God. And I hope part of the foundation that you don't get duped out by Satan is that you believe the entire Bible was written by God Almighty himself. And part of the greatness of it is that he had that human element so we could all relate to it. He uses humans that struggled with their own sins and challenges as vessels to put the word of God together for us. And so we see that the Holy Spirit has an interpretation that, that we've got to seek. We can't have our own private interpretation. We need to seek God interpretation. Amen? Amen? This leads to our second C. Common sense. Okay. Common sense. There you go. I am shocked at how the most quote-unquote intellectual people can't understand the Bible. And trust me, I've, been at Har I've done Bible study at Harvard, MIT, Brown University with students that are supposedly some of the most elite in the nation that can't grasp basic things about the Bible. Because for some reason, when it comes to the Bible, we throw out common sense. You understand, the Bible's like a library, right? If I go to a library and I read a, a book about a fiction book on vampires or some, maybe Twilight or something, I, you know, I, I might be dating myself. I don't know if that's a thing still. But, but you know, I read that. I'm going to read that book very different than I read a, a book on biology I get from the library. And, and that's the Bible. It's a bunch of books of different uh, literature, different genres of literature. And so when I read in Psalms that I, you know, I'm to hide under God's wings, I'm not looking outside for where God's wings at that I can go and get under. I, I understand that Psalms is poetry. And so common sense needs to be kept when we come to the Bible. Amen. Now, a couple things we need to understand. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Salvation requires a childlike faith. Now, you might have heard it say, people have said, oh, the Bible's written at a fifth grade level, some sixth grade level, seventh grade. Have you ever heard this before? And you guys, when you hear things like that, pass on and on and on, you just got to ask, where does that come from? And don't just repeat stuff you've never studied out. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that, that's not good. Um, and the reality is, is that Jesus does teach that salvation is by faith, meaning we got to have the faith of a child, he says. So salvation is simple. Repentance and baptism. Amen? Amen. He goes, a kid could understand that. You could have a kid that could read, that could read Acts 2.38, and he'll know the gospel. He'll know that Jesus died for his sin. The gospel is very simple. God loves you. You sinned against him. There's a break. There's a wall between you and God. If you're here for the first time visiting, maybe you never heard this. And, and that sin needs to be removed if you're going to have a relationship with God in heaven. And so G God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take on your sin for you. The ways you broke his laws and his commands. And Jesus accepts his grace to simply ask that you turn from your sin and get baptized into Christ. Amen. And there your sin is forgiven. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is a complicated book. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to look, if you will, in 2 Peter 3 in verse 15. 
Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destructions. Amen? Well, one, we learned that Peter believed that Paul's letters were scripture. Is that awesome? Yeah. Because there are actually people out there that go, well, Paul, he wasn't one of the original 12. Well, that doesn't really count or whatever. And, and he goes, no, Paul was called by God. Amen. Yeah. He wrote scripture. But Peter admitted that Paul's letters are kind of confusing sometimes. They're complex. They, they, they're, they're, they, there's a complexity to them, I should say. Yeah. And and he goes, you know, these ignorant people that don't actually know how to interpret, that don't bring common sense to the Bible, he goes, they twist these things. And when they twist these things, they cause others to be unstable in their faith. And so when we come to the Bible, we need to have a sense of common sense that we've taken English classes we know kind of different literature and we can kind of even sense it. And so I want to encourage you that you're actually probably better at interpreting the Bible than you realize. But the world has kind of told us that, you know, once you come to the Bible, because it's supernatural, that all of a sudden it's there, there's some different way of doing this, maybe. So a couple definitions I'm going to give you, right, for some big words you can look up on your own here. Uh, one's called hermeneutics. And uh, hermeneutics is a fancy term uh, for the study of interpretation. So when we talk about a, a hermeneutic, if I read a passage of scripture, now you have to stay in there here with me. Are you with me right here? Hopefully I'll, I'll put some of you to sleep, but that's okay. You can come back next week. It's not always like this. Um, hermeneutics, when we look at a passage of scripture, I can take different hermeneutical approaches to it. So I can look at it from a historical hermeneutic. Meaning, I can look at that passage, and if it's written during the time of the Roman Empire, there might be Roman customs in history that might influence what the meaning of that passage is. Are you with me right here? Yeah. I can take a grammatical hermeneutic when I look at that passage. Meaning, what's the sentence structure? What, what has possession? What's the noun? What's the verb? And that's going to determine. And different, what translators try to do is they take these hermeneutical approaches to the Bible. So sometimes if you read two different translations, there will be a different sentence structure. Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes there's debate, even uh, famous ones like John 3, verse 19 through 21, where Jesus says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness to light because their deeds are evil, etc., etc. A lot of Bibles highlight that red because they say Jesus is saying that. The old NIV did. The new NIV, if you look at it, doesn't highlight it red because they go, no, that's John saying that. What it is, it's an issue of, of grammatical criticism. They're trying to figure out the Greek, the sentence structure, and it's debated. And that's okay, amen? They're trying to figure it out. We understand the entire Bible should be in red letters. And so don't fall into this. I've seen these people out there that are like, I'm a red letter Christian, so I just study what Jesus said and stuff. They go, well, buddy, Jesus said the entire Bible comes from him. And so don't, the red letters were added in the 1900s for, to sell Bibles. Are you with me right here? Like, that, that's, that, don't get into all that stuff. Come on, bro. Grammatical. You have all kinds of canonical uh, hermeneutics where you, where you have to look at a passage and how does this relate to the rest of the Bible. So you can study this out. I'm going to give you a lot of stuff you can like look into if you want. I'll give very simple practicals at the end. Now, our charge when we read the Bible is to do what's called exegesis. So there's two types. They train preachers and there's exegesis. I'm taking you behind like the behind the scenes of being a preacher. Amen. I love it. Exegesis and there's eisegesis. Exegesis is a Greek word that you can think of the idea exit, exit from the text. You're looking at the text and you're trying to find the meaning from the text. Eisegesis, you can think of Isis like enter into. Eisegesis is I go, huh, I want to make this passage say this. And I bring my meaning into the passage. Um, this is why I like preaching through books of the Bible. Because when you preach through a book of the Bible... You let God determine what the message is going to be. Right. Now, there's times to meet needs in the church and this sort of thing. But trust me, if, I, if you guys had me do eisegesis all the time and you wanted me just to preach like topical sermons every Sunday, 
uh, this would be a church that's all about like angels and demons and hell and the end times. <laughs> Say, why is that? Because that's the stuff that fascinates me. I love that stuff in the Bible. <laughs> but it'd be a pretty weird church. We'd all be afraid uh, all the time of if Jesus is going to come back or not. You get what I'm saying? Because preachers that preach using eisegesis, they create their care. The church becomes a character of them. Versus when you preach through the Bible, the church becomes what God intended it to be. Because Jesus wants to build the church. And so, understand, uh, I'll give you an example. Go to Revelation chapter 8 here. Revelation chapter 8. Um, we've, we've replaced the communion today with the sermon. So the sermon will be a little longer than normal, but it's, it's be, we're goodbye in time as they count the contribution to see where our mission ends. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 8, so if I forget at the end to pray for the communion, just remind me, okay? <laughs> in uh, Revelation chapter 8. So I'll give you an example of eisegesis here. And Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, it says, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Now, I said, Jesus goes, Oh my gosh, America, that's what that is, because there's an eagle there. <laughs> And the eagle represents America. And oh my goodness, America's pronouncing judgment through the woes on the inhabitants of the earth because America must be God's people. America's the number one nation. Amen. That's, that's eisegesis. Now what I just shared with you is a real view about this scripture. Just so you know. What exegesis goes, does is goes, who wrote Revelation? Okay, John did. What's the context What's the type of literature? Well, Revelation's written in what's called apocalyptic uh, genre, which is poetry, believe it or not, symbolic. And so we know that then I got to figure out what did the eagle mean to John back in that time? You get what I'm saying? And I'm not going to get into all Revelation today. I'm just making a point that eisegesis people do this. They look at, there's other passages where the locusts are flying and it kind of describes them as having these wings that make these thundering sounds and this breastplate and all this stuff. And there are people out there, they go, oh, those are helicopters. That's what that is. And there's garbage movies out there like the Left Behind series that is total false doctrine and satanic. Where all they do is they do eisegesis. I can't tell you how many Christians are going to be, oh, who's the Antichrist going to be? I go, have you ever actually looked up the word Antichrist in the Bible? Because the Bible teaches there's no such thing. And the Bible says there are many Antichrists. It says anyone who denies Christ is an Antichrist. Exact quote. So if you're not Christian, you're an Antichrist. Are you with me right here? And many have come and gone. But you got these people that just believe that some movie they saw. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's like mind-blowing. Common sense is lacking, right? So if you want to study something out, you got you to consider what happens. So again, I don't want to get sidetracked on the end times and all that stuff. And there is a place for different uh, opinions. There are admittedly, and I think it takes humility to come to complicated passages and go, you know, and you guys know I try to present the different views. You get what I'm saying? Because I know I can feel super strongly about something something, but I need to be humble myself. If it doesn't relate to salvation, salvation can't mess up on. A child can understand it. Yeah, that's right. The other scriptures, he goes, ignorant and unstable men try to distort them. So we need to seek the right interpretation. I mean, it's so sad in the 17 and the 1800s, slave owners used the Bible and weaponized it to actually say that black people were not human. Yeah. using pre-Adamite theories and the curse of Canaan and Genesis and doing eisegesis. Oh, they, these people are from this part of the world, so that's who they are. They must be the slaves and the descent and all these theological gymnastics to do what they want. Are you with me right here? Yeah. So hermeneutics are absolutely important. This is why at our church, when you look around, the true disciples take notes because they're trying to study and they want to know, they want to compare the scriptures in context and go, is this really come from God or not? Are you with me right here? And so this leads to our third C is context. Amen. Amen. So you want to have some common sense? 
And then you want to figure out what's the context. Context is king. I mean, we see this in politics all the time, don't we? You can take like a clip that somebody said or whatever and take it out of its context and go, oh, this guy's racist or this guy's that or whatever. And it's just kind of crazy, you know what I'm saying? And so this is the, we understand the world. People do this all the time. They take things out of its context and create all kinds of stories about it. And we can't do that with the Bible. For many of us, before we studied the Bible, we did that. We believed that, oh, you're just saved by faith alone. We did. And then someone showed us in James chapter 2 that it says you're not saved by faith alone. <laughs> Direct quote. But this is the craziness of people that they believe things that were just handed down to them. So how do we figure out context? I think some good questions, the first two questions to ask when you read in your quiet time a Bible passage is one, what would this have meant to the original author? Like what would this have meant to the guy writing it, right? And then the second question is what would this have meant to the original reader? The church that's receiving it, uh, the people, the king that's supposed to listen to it, whatever. Like, what would that have meant then? And here's the thing. It's not going to mean something different all of a sudden today. You go, well, God's living and active and he speaks to us in different ways. He puts on our hearts. He can impress different things from a passage from us that hit us differently. But the meaning's not going to be different. Come on. And, and, and that's where you get into some danger. So it's kind of funny. Most of Revelation, for example, in Revelation chapter one, it says that these things are written for the seven churches of Asia and it's things that are going to happen soon for them. Yeah. So believe it or not, 80 percent of Revelation is not about the end of the world. Right. It's about the Roman Empire. Yeah. You go, the beast sits on seven hills. Well, guys, the Rome was called the city of seven hills. The beast is Rome falling. Yeah. But, but, but I'm just making a point that these are images that they're using, but people have actually tried to make this into monsters like Godzilla that's going to come back one day or, you know, and, you know, all this crazy stuff uh, because they're just, they love conspiracy. They love a good movie, like an American movie, and, and they're trying to put that into the Bible instead of the message was for the original readers to not give up under intense persecution uh, that they were undergoing and that apocalyptic language is coded language so that if the emperor gets a hold of Revelation, he doesn't know it's talking about him amen yeah. uh, that, that's the whole point so we need context uh, turn to your table of contents in your bible here for a minute okay. so hopefully your bible has a table of contents if you have a chronological one you're going to be thrown off here but that's okay <laughs> all right um, as you're turning there, I think it's good to read the Bible in what I call thoughts. So what's a thought? Uh, it's like a section that goes together. Now here's the thing, everyone can have different ideas of what sections go together. But that's what makes it fun, is when you read a book of the Bible, it's fun to outline it. So for example, Genesis, we, we read one through three could be a thought. The beginnings of man and the fall of man. And then four and five might be like the genealogies of the beginning of the human race or something. Or you could do, uh, you could do chapters of Genesis 1 through 12 would be one thought, just the foundations, beginning of our world. And then after chapter 12, now we're introduced to a new story with Abraham and the whole rest of the books about Abraham and his sons. Um, reading the Bible and thoughts helps you get the main picture and the main theme. So then when you read those sections or a passage of scripture, you can kind of place it in there. Amen. Now, in the table of contents, we need to understand that the Bible was not written in chrono chronological order. OK, so the oldest book in the Bible, actually, does anyone know which one it is? Job. Job's the oldest book in the Bible. Oh, I thought it was Genesis. Well, Genesis was written after Job. Now, Genesis chronicles things that are older than Job, but, but the, Job is the oldest book of the Bible. But for Jewish people, they weren't so concerned about chronology and like time and ordering. Are you with me right here? And we need to understand that the Bible isn't going to answer questions it was not asking in the first place or meant to answer. So some people are like, how old's the earth? We got to find out in the Bible. Well, the Bible's not going to answer that for you. Are there aliens in the world? Well, the Bible's not going to answer that for you because it's, it's not about that. You get what I'm saying? Um, where can I find the Big Bang or where can I find, you know, th these types of things are what lead people off astray and get into eisegesis and trying to put in their own ideas in the Bible. So when you look at your Old Testament table of contents, um, we can divide the Bible and people do it different ways. But this is kind of the most common and simplistic is Genesis through Deuteronomy uh, is called the law. Or the Pentateuch, meaning the first five books of the Bible. If you want to be really Jewish, you could call it the Torah. Um, but that, that's the heart of the Old Testament. 
And that's important because everything goes back to the heart that brings the rest of the Old Testament life. So after Deuteronomy comes Joshua and Joshua through Esther is history. Amen. So when you're reading history now, history is in Genesis, for example, is in Exodus. So when you're reading history, it's like you're watching a play. I had a brother the other day. I can't remember who it was. Someone asked me. I think it was when Abraham like lied. Do you remember when Abraham lies about his uh, sister? Yeah. And someone asked me, why did God not punish him for lying? And I'm thinking in my head, dude, do you want God to punish you for everything you do? You know what I mean? Like, like, like if, if, if every time you sin, you know, there's a punishment. But again, it just shows how we read the Bible, right? We don't read it with common sense of a sense of like human. And if you're the one that asked me, that, I can't remember who did. I'm sorry. But, but um, we, we don't read the Bible with a sense of common sense where it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, there's hundreds of years people are in sin and rebellion and God does nothing. Um, if you want to look at it from that perspective, of course, he does something in the sense of our judgment sealed and there's things in heaven we, we have to await and all that. But but so if I look at Abraham in that situation, I got to go, how do I know if it was a sin or not? Why did God continue to bless him? Why well, got to go back to the heart of the Bible, the law? What's the law say? Did he sin? Yes. And amen. He lied. We look at David. He commits adultery. How do we know adultery is even a sin? The law, amen? The first five books of the Bible. Does that make sense? So, so this is important. Now, what, did, what, what was supposed to happen to someone that commits adultery according to the law? It's supposed to be stoned. So you go, well, well, David didn't get stoned. That's interesting. So again, then that, that creates a connection. You can kind of like, I need to study this out. And so I'm just trying to give you ideas, guys, on how you study your Bibles. That makes sense? Like you're going back to the heart is the law, the first five books, history, Joshua through Esther. And then we get to Job through Song of Songs. And this is called poetry or wisdom literature. Nice. And poetry and wisdom literature is a different part of the library. It's not to be read the same way as the law. So I'll give you some examples. Ecclesiastes talks about drink and be merry and stuff like that. And I can take those verses and go, wow, that looks awesome. I'm going to go live it up. Amen. Uh, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, give beer to those who are perishing. You know, man, I've had a tough day. Let's just drink it up. You know what I'm saying? And live it up. Right. I got Bible verses to support this. Right. <laughs> but but Ecclesiastes is written almost like a poem where there's a conclusion at the end. He goes, I did all this stupid stuff that he glorifies in the writing of it. But at the end, he goes, but I learned the only thing that counts is fearing God and obeying his commandments. There, there's, there's a conclusion, right? That's why if you don't read it as a thought. You're going to get jacked up and think, wow, this is OK. You know, um, Proverbs. This is another one that a lot of disciples mess up. This is hurt a lot of people. I'm about to tell you. Proverbs are not promises. So the Bible says in Proverbs, if you fear God, you're going to have long life. You go, oh man, Peter and Paul must have not feared God because they died young. No. Proverbs are probabilities, not promises. So the probability, I'm godly. I'm not going to be got shot in a gang. I'm not going to do drugs and overdose and die. I'm probably not going to get an STD and die early. I'm not going to, I'm going to be more healthy because I'm going to take care of my temple. Because if I fear God, the probability is I'm going to live long. But, but, but there's exceptions to that. So the one that hurt a lot of people in the ICOC is says, if you raise a child in the way he should go, in time, if he falls away and he departs from it, he'll come back. It's like, oh, that's a promise. No, it's a probability. Yeah. And, and, and truth, the probability is, is, is if you raise a kid in the way he should go, if he's departed from it, when he goes through a tough time, he's going to come back to it. And we've seen that happen over and over yeah. and over again. But it's not a promise. Yeah. He may never choose to come back to it. And so Proverbs are probabilities. It's wisdom literature to live your life. Get advice and it will go well for you. Well, have you ever gotten advice and it's bad advice and it's going terrible? Yeah. Well, I thought the Bible promised me many advisors and makes victory sure. Well, yeah, but you got to, it's wisdom and you got to kind of work on who you're getting advice from. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you know, you go, I wanted to date and I got all advice from all my roommates and it didn't go well. Well, how about some like married people? Amen. Some people actually accomplish what you want. Are you with me right here? Right? 
So this is this. These are the the wisdom literature, and I, I go on about that. Even Job, you know, people mess around with. I mean, it's so funny. Job Job has kind of a prosperity gospel. I've seen people send out like verses from Job, like, "Hey, if you you are righteous, it's gonna go well for you, and you'll be wealthy." And so there's there's verses like that in the book of Job. But these, if you actually read the whole thing, you see that these are some of his sinful friends giving him bad advice, <laughs> trying to accuse him that he, you know, somehow brought this upon himself because of how wicked he was. And God's like, no, that's not, that's not the point. So you got to be careful what you're reading in the book of Job, and you send out some text message about it. I'll never forget one brother sends out a message to encourage everybody in a group chat one time. He's like, man, I read this radical scripture, guys, and it said in Romans, in Romans it says, you know, um, those uh, who obey the gospel uh, will be the ones that are justified or something like that. Or those who are fully obedient to the law will be justified. He's like, guys, we just got to be obedient, completely obedient today. And I'm sitting there going, dude, no one's completely obedient. Yeah. And you just took that passage out of context. He's making the point that you actually can't be perfect <laughs> and that you need God's mercy wow. and you need God's grace. So I'm totally against these dumb devotional books that are like January chapter, chapter one, you know, and, and it has one little verse and, it, you know, you're, you're just looking for some warm fuzzy. Yeah. Um, if you know your Bible and you have context, they're awesome. Because those warm fuzzies, sometimes you need them. Are you with me right here? There's some great devotional books, but I'm against them if that's where you're starting off. You need to read your whole Bible first before you read devotional books. You need to read a bi your Bible first before you read some commentary and have some other person get in there. And so, if you haven't read the entire Bible, my challenge to you is to read the Bible cover to cover. You know, they got these plans starting the New Testament, starting the, the, just read the whole thing. You know what I mean? And challenge yourself to get to know it. Amen. Now it goes on after the wisdom literature, you've got the prophets. Amen. And that's from, uh, you know, you've got Isaiah all the way down to Malachi. And some people divide it major, minor prophet. I don't personally like that because it implies like the, the minor ones are like not as important or something that they, they just didn't write as long. Amen. <laughs> but these are all the prophets. Now, here's the thing. When we understand the Old Testament, now we can understand why the New Testament's broken down the way it is. So the heart of the New Testament are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the law of Christ is what Paul calls it. So we have the law of Christ. And then after the New Testament law, the law of grace, if you will, we have history, just like in the Old Testament. What's the history? The book of Acts. So when we see things being done in the book of Acts, we have questions about, we can always go back to the heart, the Gospels, amen? And we always got to look at what did Jesus say about this as we interpret what Paul is teaching, amen? Then you've got the epistles, or the letters to the churches, and in some cases they're to individuals, Romans through Jude. And then, of course, just like the Old Testament ended with prophets and prophecy, uh, the New Testament ends with the book of Revelation with prophecy. Amen. So understanding how the Bible's broken down in the literature is very important to understanding and the will and the plan of God. You guys with me right here? All right. So a couple more things here when we talk about context. Um, we need to understand the difference between commands and examples. So, the Bible sometimes gives commands. Uh, what are some commands in the Bible you guys can think of off the top of your head? Repent, Repent and be baptized, right? That's not an option, right? Uh, what else? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, seek first his kingdom, right? Uh, obey your leaders, Hebrews 13, right? Like, there, there's all these different commands that are non-negotiables that we have to just obey, amen? So where the Bible speaks, we're silent. We just obey what it says. Now there are examples. You know, there are churches where they require the women to wear coverings over their heads. And these churches have not understood interpretation because they read something in 1 Corinthians 11, and we went over as the men, we're on it, as the men, guys, brothers, we understand that passage now. And we broke it down using a historical hermeneutic to go to the conclusion that we need to, amen? And, and we got some great principles from it. Uh, I see even some of the brothers are, have radically changed from it as well, amen? And I'll just say that. Um, some churches believe you have to meet in a home. I'm serious. There are churches out there, people that have even left our movement go, it's sin to meet in a building like this or to have church buildings. And so they meet in homes. To their credit, it's actually a more biblical thing. 
Yeah. You say, what do I mean by that? Well, it's more biblical because that's what they did in the Bible times is they actually met in homes. Yeah. Now, is there a command ever to meet in the home? No. And you'll actually find they met in other places, in temple courts. They met at the lecture hall of Tyrannus, which was most likely a rabbi Paul rented this building from. So there, there, there are things out there that these are just examples, but these people will go, well, that's the Bible. And so they take up, if it's where the Bible speaks, we speak, meaning if it's only in the Bible, then we have authority to do it. But if the Bible's silent on it, then it's forbidden. And so they see these things are forbidden. I go, if we're going to do that, then why don't we give contribution in special missions the way they did back in the early church? You know what they did in Acts chapter four, the, the example we have? They brought the money to the apostles' feet. And I told you guys that, right? Like, that'd be weird if, if, if today for special missions, I go, all right, guys, bring it and drop it right here. <laughs> and we can do that. I saw a clip one time, Creflo Dollar, some false, false prophet. All these people are bringing money and throwing it on the stage. He's like dancing on the money on the stage. Like, like you know what I mean? This stuff. And I'm like, that's crazy. You know what I mean? But technically we could do that and there would actually be nothing against the Bible doing it. But, you know, we go with wisdom, you know, something that's just an example. We could also wear sandals and we could also wear robes like Jesus. We could also, I mean, how far does this go? We have to obey the commands and then where the Bible's silent or where there's example, think about what's best. We know that it's probably not best to put money at a preacher's feet in today's society with how much distrust has been broken. If the Bible commanded it, we would do it. Who cares what trust has been broken? If it was, but it's not a command. Are you with me right here? So that's why it's important when you read your Bible to go, is this a command? Is this an example? Is this an inference? Or what, what am I supposed to gather here? People, there are, there are churches that do fish, feet washing ceremonies. You know, there are churches out there where the women can't wear pants or they can't wear skirts or they can't, you know, and all based on eisegesis or taking little scriptures here or there like it's some buffet. Um, so hyperbole is important. There's hyperbole in the, in the Bible. Anyone know what hyperbole is? Yeah. Exaggeration. To make a point. So there are churches that believe tongues are some supernatural language that only them and God can understand. When the Bible literally says they're human languages to go and preach the gospel to non-believers. If you don't know about that, you can come to First Principles and we'll teach you through it. Amen? But the problem is, is that they look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul goes, man, if I had faith that could move mountains. Now, did Paul ever move a mountain? No, he's using hyperbole. He goes, if I surrendered my body to the flames. And in that same passage, he goes, if I spoke in tongues like angels. He's making a point. He goes, but I have not love. I'm a resounding gong. It goes on. He's using hyperbole. It's not that there's an angelic tongue. Not that we can literally zap mountains or anything like that. Um, you know, Jesus says, hey, if you lust, if you're struggling with lust, gouge out your eye and cut off your hand because it's with your eyes that you lust it's with your hand that you masturbate or are immoral or into impurity and these sort of things if a brother showed up here at service and didn't have his eyes and had his hands cut off and we're like oh my gosh bro what happened he's like i got radical for the lord <laughs> Amen. I think his heart would be saved, you know. I mean, he's trying to do what's right, but I go, that's not what that meant. In fact, you sinned by destroying your temple and risking your life there. Jesus is using exaggeration to make a point that you got to be radical about your sin and willing to do whatever it takes so that you don't struggle with it. Are you with me right here? Common sense would tell you that. But again, we don't live in a world where it applies common sense to the Bible. Amen. And so there's, there's much more I could say. We've talked about context. Um, people have get confused all the time. And, and it's not a new thing, guys. Like, in the Bible, we have this. Jesus says, you got to be born of water and spirit. And Nicodemus is like, how can you, uh, someone enter back into their mother's womb? You know what I mean? And <laughs> totally missing the point. No common sense. The, 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 the Samaritan woman, you know, is like, where's this living water I can get so I can drink it and never die or whatever. And he's like, dude, I'm using, like, understand my language and didn't jesus say in john hey why is my language not clear to you right and because we were trying and the biggest one is you know eat my flesh and drink my blood in john 6 you remember that one yeah. unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no part in me and they're like oh gosh thinking he's teaching cannibalism or something 
And it's like, dude, if you just thought, man, he's probably not saying as just, you know, his body's right there talking to you. And he's probably not saying, hey, take a bite out of me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's actually a more spiritual meaning. And yet today you've got a whole denomination that believes that they actually are eating Jesus's physical flesh and his physical blood and drinking it. Which is insanity. Insanity. And yet, they've thrown out common sense, and Jesus even interprets what he meant when he says, my words are spirit, and they are truth, that this is feeding every word is the bread of God, the bread of life. Are you with me right here? So, uh, I mean, other ones that are dangerous, um, when you don't understand the context, I can't tell you growing up, I've heard so many things, it's the, the mark of the beast, right? This is the, the 666. When I was young, everyone was concerned it was going to be a, a Bill Gates like Microsoft uh, chip when they were coming up, you know, with processors and stuff at the time. And so they were like concerned about these chips getting in. And it's funny because now there's chips in all of our debit cards and stuff now and no one cares. But at the time it was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is where they're going to get you. Like somehow God is going to just trick you and you didn't know and you're going to go to hell and you're going to have the mark of the beast like some unjust God or something. Like it's just crazy, you know? And then over time, I remember it became, it was like a microchip. I, in 2020, it was the COVID vaccine you know like that the, I had a guy in my church sit down with me and break down all the COVID vaccine and why it matches the numbers and near and and I'm sitting there feeling sorry for this person like I'm just like you are like totally sound insane right now like that's what the early church was to get from reading this letter that was passed to the churches of Asia that in 2020, the COVID-19 vaccine. And again, I'm not, if you're for the vaccine or not against it, whatever, that's not the point I'm making. I'm just saying that that's not what that's talking about. <laughs> um, gosh, and it, and it goes on and on. You know, Obama's the Antichrist and Trump's the Antichrist and, the, you know, the, this, this era is the end of the world or May 21st, 2000, you know, you guys heard all this stuff? Or just, I'm a preacher, so I hear it all. Everyone comes to me asking these things, right? And it's just totally beyond stupidity and it's sad and this leads to the fourth c is culture uh -huh. and again i talked a lot about this so i'm not going to hit it but for the old testament to understand it you got to little know a little bit about mesopotamian culture um you know you study out the hembrati code in in school and these sort of things but um you can just get a book on this i encourage everyone download an app called libby and you can download any book for free I don't know why people go on Kindle and buy these books, you know what I mean? It's, 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 a, it's a library. And so you just sign up, you, you have to get a library card at the LA library or wherever, but you can, a lot of times you can do it online and you can download any book, amen? But I love, you can download a book on ancient cultures and understand their customs if you want to dig deeper into it. If you're in the New Testament, you probably want to study out which empire? Rome. Um, if you're reading Daniel and stuff, you might need to study out, you know, Greek empires. It came like there's there's all these different books that you can get to understand world history and, and customs. Amen. So this is important to understand the culture because you're going to have people that go, why does the Bible support slavery? You ever had that one? And they go, you know, I, I could never believe in a book that supports and condones slavery because what they're doing is eisegesis. They're taking what we know of from the 1700s and the 1800s and trying to apply that into the Bible when slavery is very different in the Bible than the slavery of that time. Are you with me right here? In fact, in ancient cultures, you got to remember, guys, they didn't have a human resources department. So, you know, you couldn't complain to your company if your master was treating you bad. Um, so there were evil masters that did treat them bad in, the, in Roman times, in historical times, and then there were good masters. In fact, believe it or not, some of the masters and slaves were Christians and brothers and sisters in the Bible. Um, and this is just how society functioned. Uh, literally, women would be saved from like uh, not being able to eat and dying by going into slavery in someone's home and being treated. And, and a lot of times, often they were treated well and treated as part of the family. Are you with me right here? And that's hard for us to understand unless you read a book on like bond servants and the culture at that time. And it doesn't mean God permits his forced slavery. Remember, God is, came into history and he, he allows things to happen, but he teaches then, okay, if you, this is a society that believes in slaves, this is how you need to treat them and you treat them as family you treat them good in fact god says you gotta remember you were slaves in egypt so remember how you were treated are you with me right here under pharaoh so this is these are important things when you think about culture yeah. fifthly number five is canon canon you guys still with me here yeah. let me check to see if we got the uh 
announcement yet. Okay, sadly, PayPal hasn't updated yet. Okay, amen. Um, Canon, what's Canon? Well, I'm not talking about like a weapon, amen? Uh, you guys ever heard about the, the Bible being canonized? Yeah. And so canonization is when they got all the books of the Bible and they put them in a book. Now, remember, codexes and books started coming out uh, towards the time uh, around Constantine when he was uh, becoming emperor and he legalized Christianity. And what he did is he called all the church leaders at the time to come together at a council. And one of the things that's out there that's a myth that's just not true is they say, oh, the church then in Constantine or the Catholic church, they decided which books were going to be in the Bible. You guys ever heard that one? Yeah. And I just, you just, all you have to do is this. You just ask them, oh, where'd you get that from? Or where'd you hear that from? There is not one source to support that at all. Wow. You won't find one, like none at all. In fact, what they did is they recognized at that council meeting the books that were already in circulation and had been for around 300 years and simply put them all together in a book called the Bible. And some of these Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, for example, was a known fraud and not quoted by the early church ever yeah. as, as scripture in that sense. Yeah, wow. And so these are, these are things that are important. You go, oh, the book of Enoch. Well, yeah, amen. They saw the book of Enoch as good history, but they didn't see it as part of the word of God. Right. Um, and the Council of Trent uh, in the 1500s, uh, the Catholic Church uh, permitted uh, extra books to be added to the Bible. Um, but they didn't, even for them, it wasn't at the same level as the Bible that we've always had historically. Are you with me right here? So canon is important. Now let's go, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3 here. If we don't get our number in, I won't, I won't hold you guys hostage um, <laughs> in, 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 until it does. We can announce it at leaders meeting. Amen. <laughs> In 2 Timothy 3, I think they're, he's texting they're having problems with PayPal because they're going to try to announce it to the entire city of Angels Church. Um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? Amen. So, is it just the red letters that are inspired by God? No. no. The entire Bible is from God. And you can use your Old Testament to correct, rebuke, and instruct. Amen? But when we talk about canon, what are we talking about? You ever stumbled upon a scripture that's just like weird? And you're like, what in the world does that mean? There's one we're going to study out next week in our men's session on Corinthians that talks about baptizing for the dead. Right. You go, what in the world does that mean? Or you ever seen one that, you know, a woman will only be saved through childbearing. Yeah. Go, oh, no, I give only if I have kids, then I can become a Christian. Oh, that's probably not what it means, right? Um, there's ones that seem to imply, if you just read them out of context, that if you fall away, you can never come back and know the Lord again. There's, there, there, there's these challenging passages. And what canonical criticism does is it goes, okay, this passage is, is stumping me here. And so I've got to study this out in light of the rest of the entire Bible. Right. And goes, is there anything else that would support this or go against this? If it seems like everything else goes against what this is saying, that, okay, dead people can't have faith. I know that. That's interesting. Okay, so you need faith to become a Christian. So it's probably not supporting baptizing dead people. You get what I'm saying? And so, again, common sense, but at the same time, canonical criticism using the entire Bible to figure out where does this fall in place? Where does it fall in place in the story, the story of God? And we do this, guys. One of the most common objections against baptism is the thief on the cross. Yeah. And they go, well, Jesus saved the thief on the cross. But simple canonical criticism goes, huh, we know that people weren't baptized in the Old Testament because baptism isn't in the Old Testament. In fact, you had to sacrifice animals and things like that. We know that Jesus hadn't died yet when he talked to the thief and many others, the prostitute and all this kind of stuff. And what's baptism mean? It's participating in Jesus' death. 
And we know Hebrews 9, so I'm taking different parts of the Bible. Hebrews 9 teaches that a will is not in fact until there's death, until the blood was shed. Yeah. And so the new covenant actually didn't start until after Jesus died. And so, oh, okay, so that doesn't apply, buddy. <laughs> you know, that one doesn't work. Yeah. You're, you're not, as the Bible says, correctly handling the word of God. And I like the King James Version in 2 Timothy 2.15 says, correctly divide, rightly dividing the word of God. Meaning, what time are we in? Guys, I'm not under the Ten Commandments, just so you know. And neither are you. If you were, we'd be meeting on Saturday, not Sunday. That was a covenant that was given to Israel. Now, I can learn about God's heart from it. I go, God wants people to take some rest for themselves. Praise God. He's got a great heart for us. Uh, I can learn about legal codes and how uh, the nation should be run as God's governors based on looking at Israel. I can learn about God's heart for all the nations, the prophecies. But the Old Testament fundamentally is to lead us to Jesus Christ. And it says everything in the Old Testament is about Jesus. They're, they're shadows. They give us hints about his character and his life. And Jesus is the substance. Amen. And so read your Old Testament. Challenge yourself to know the Old Testament. Um, I want to close talking about translations a little bit um, of the Bible. Uh, for years, the King James Version of the Bible, which was written in 1611, uh, was unknown to most is actually it was a revision of other Bibles. And um, you're going to meet people to this day that swear that the King James Version was divinely given by God. You ever study the Bible with someone that like, I don't use any other Bible. And, and I don't study the Bible with those people because um, it, it, they're not willing to learn and be taught that this is actually based off older uh, manuscripts that are like uh, thousands of years uh, from the original events, where a lot of the newer translations we've discovered in the 40s, actually older manuscripts. And so we have a little bit more accurate view. Now, King James is an incredible translation. I think it's beautiful. I love it. But it's an archaic language that we don't use today. And so it's hard for people to understand. So with translations of the Bible, you've got kind of two different sides. You've got what's called word-for-word -word literal translation, and then you've got what's called a paraphrase translation. What translators try to do is they try to strike a balance in the middle. Because just like any language, if you translate someone speaking Spanish word for word, is it going to make sense? No. no. You have to do some translation work and some grammatical work. Um, and two different translators are going to translate and use different variations. But if they're doing a good job, it's going to say essentially the same thing. So at the furthest extreme is the paraphrase. So the word for word looks at how do we translate that as close to literally as possible, where the paraphrase looks at the manuscripts and the original language and goes, they read it, they translate it, they go, okay, how would I say this as an American? And then write it down or whatever. The, the, fur, the, 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 the worst paraphrase ever is the Message Bible. There's like nothing about it's close to like the original at all. Are you with me right here? Um, a lot of people like it. It's nice. But even the guy who wrote it didn't believe it was to be taken as an actual Bible. <laughs> and so I, I view the message as a commentary. Uh, some of the furthest ones that are closest to that are like the, the, the TPT or the voice or there's um, the New Living Translation would be more towards that, that, that direction. Um, way over here is the, the, the most literal one would be the New American Standard Bible. And you go, why don't you preach from that if it's the closest to that? Well, it wouldn't read very well. No. It's too choppy because of how they translate it. And so we kind of come over, over here. You have the King James and then you have kind of the NIV. And so in this little box here is like NIV, Christian Standard Bible, King James, New King James translation. Are, those are all pretty good translations that are going to help you understand. All right. Yeah. And so those are incredible Bibles uh, to buy. And I try to read through different translations. Um, and I just like learning more, hearing what people do, say. Amen. All right. So finally, the last six C is counsel. Counsel. Romans 15, 14 says we're all competent to counsel one another. Amen. And Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says that my role as an evangelist, Lou Jack's role, the shepherd's role is to equip the saints for works of service. So we are supposed to be specialized in these areas so that we can train you how to read your Bible in a healthy way. Are you with me right here? And so what do we do? Well, Here's a couple practicals I want to give you uh, to end with on how to study your Bible. And why I say counsel is get a lot of counseling on how to read your Bible. Amen. Yeah. Get a lot of insight and get a lot of advice. 
Number one practical is be solid on the first principles. Amen. Be solid on the fundamentals. If, 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 you're, if you're shaky on how to even become a Christian, maybe you're visiting, you don't even know, you got to study the Bible and learn the basics. Amen? Secondly, use a good translation. If you're still trying to read out the King James Version and you're having a hard time, that, that's going to be challenging. Get a, a translation that works well. And three, pray before you read the Bible. You know, Luke 24 says God opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So pray that God, I want to understand the Bible in a deeper way. Ask questions of the text. Who's the author? Who's this written to? Practice mirror reading. Remember, you're hearing like one end of a phone conversation. And so you're, you're kind of trying to guess what was being said on the other end. What are the issues Paul's trying to address? Find the central theme of the passage. Look for words that stand out over and over again and do a word study. You know, we talked about in 1 Corinthians 1, the word Lord appears over and over and over again. So if I'm studious, I might go, let me look up the Greek meaning for that word, Lord. Now, how do you look up the Greek meaning? I studied Greek in seminary and in undergrad, and sadly I've lost most of it. There's one other brother in our church that knows it very well, it's Jason Woody. And he, he has his quiet times in the Greek Bible, so he retained it, which I should have done, I would call him, but I didn't know. But I understand Greek, and I understand how when it's used right and when it's used wrong. Okay. And I'm going to tell you, 90% of preachers do this wrong. Uh, what they'll do is they'll see a word, and they'll pull up an app, and the app you all should download, Blue Letter Bible. And if you want to know the Greek word, Blue Letter Bible is awesome because you just hit the word, and it pops up the Greek meaning. Now, every Greek word has multiple meanings, just like English words do. Yeah. And so what a preacher will do sometimes, he'll click the Greek word, and he'll find the most like intense, fiery-sounding meaning to it, and go, guys, you know, I studied the Greek, and this is what it can mean in the Greek. Boom. The problem is, is context has to determine what it means. Not like you choosing the word. So, for example, if I shoot Blue Jack a text today and go, what's up, dog? Um... I'm saying, hey, what's up to my buddy? My slang term, right, from the 90s, of what's up, dog, or whatever, right? Or D-A-W-G, right, or something. Like that. <laughs> I used to have this song, we love the dogs, that when I was younger. <laughs> um, but, you know, 2,000 years from now, if they're doing a case study of what the international Christian churches believed, and they're pulling up old text messages on an app similar to Blue Letter Bible, and they click, you know, what's up, dog? And they click my word dog, and the definitions come up, uh, a biological animal, that, you know, blah, 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 a slang term used in the 90s for your friend, you know, uh, uh, you know, and then the other bad things for dog, you know? Um, you could go and look at that and go, oh, wow, the International Christian Church believed that you could talk to your animals. <laughs> Lou Jack must have been his dog. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. But I'm telling you, preachers do that all the time. And I correct them on it all the time, you know, when I hear it. Because there's where I heard dynamos means, you know, the, the dynamite. Guy. That's actually not what it means if you study it out. And so the context is, is key and important in understanding the meaning. And so Blue Letter Bible is a great app. Studylight.org is great for a commentaries if you want to read commentaries. I'm not a big fan of commentaries, but if there's a book I'd encourage you to get, it's called Haley's Bible Handbook. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's great because what it does is you can look, if I'm studying Genesis, I just turn to Haley's and Genesis, and it gives you like archaeological finds, history, like stuff like that to help supplement your reading. It does give some commentary, but it's not overly good, trying to tell you what to believe about the things. And it's a great handbook with lots of your visual learner. Uh, if you want to be a preacher, pulpit commentary is great. We suggest that in ICCM because it, it talks about reading the Bible through more of a uh, preacher's eyes. Amen. And then finally, share what you're learning with others. Because yeah. if you can teach others what you learned, that means you actually know it. You've retained it. And so hopefully today you have a new genesis of how you read your Bible. 
and you go back and you understand that the enemy is always going to be trying to get you to question the Word of God. But if you can decide, number one, to commit to your study of the Word of God. Number two, use your common sense. Take the common sense that you already have into your study of the Bible. Three, understand the context of the scriptures you're reading through different hermeneutics. And four, maybe study the culture. And five, how it relates to the entire Bible, the canon of scripture. And six, get a lot of advice and counsel from those who are more mature than you in the Lord. And I believe with all my heart, you're going to become approved by God as one who correctly handles the Word of God. My challenge for you today, grab a book of the Bible, outline it, master it, and become a scholar of one book in the Bible. And to God be the glory. Amen. All right, we're going to pray for our time of communion here. Let's pray as we take communion. Father, uh, God, we want to come before you right now and, and offer to you, God, the bread that's your broken body. We know, God, it doesn't represent, it's not symbolic, it is, but it is by faith, not because it turns into the substance, God. We, we know, Lord, that we do it by faith because your words is life. And I pray as we take this communion, we'll examine our hearts. We'll, we'll, as we've been talking about the last few weeks, we'll have time of quiet meditation. Uh, Father, where we can really reflect on our lives, God. I, I pray, Lord, you take away any distractions from our heart, anything that's undivided. And right now, we'll, if there's any sin in our hearts, we'll confess it to you, our high priest, so that you can forgive us, so we can take communion in a right way. Uh, Father, if there's any relationship that's not right right now, I, I, I pray God will repent before you in our hearts so we can take communion, and then immediately after, we'll get that relationship reconciled. Uh, Jesus, we need your blood. We need you every single day to live life. Thank you for our church. Uh, God, I pray people are impacted today. I know the sermon was a little bit different today and uh, a little bit more academic, but God, I do pray that, Father God, we can love you not just with all our heart, soul, and strength, but also love you with our mind. And uh, Father, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.